And uh, I don't know, do you, I'm just going to ask you all, there ain't nobody here but us, so we won't have nobody to impress. But do you guys get to thinking and wonder which one of us will be first? Do you do that? I do that sometimes, and I think, what would I do if I got up one morning and I was sitting here by myself? That's not a pleasant thought. But that day's a coming just as sure. And then what goes on after that is then I don't go looking forward. I turn around and look back. And I think, where have you been? My, the memories and the things, they start rolling and all like that. And I feel like I've just lived my life in vain for the most part. I, do you ever have those moments? Or, or, and uh, so it's kind of, I don't have to feel bad, huh? Well, I'd like to have done more and accomplished more because I realized that my opportunities to be able to do those things are narrowing down. Uh, as a hundred times I sat over there and I thought, boy, I'd like to go down to Mexico or Guatemala and hold a good revival. Let's like go down well, me I could go thrashing a guitar and they would they'd be less there than they are here. And uh, it wouldn't be long before you would you'd have to worry wonder how to where to put everybody. And I thought, I'd like to go do that, but it's dawned on me that past time or two, I come back on airplanes, I sick, and took two or three days to get over it. And I can't eat stuff just anywhere or anyhow. And when I do, I pay for it. But um, so it dawned on me, you, you can just want to go down there and do that all you want to, but them days are pretty well past. You're, you had your chance and that's what you, wasn't much, but that's what you made of it. You got to live with that. That's a little unpleasant, but then that leads me, this verse of scripture I'm going to start out with here. Everybody knows it. Everybody's heard it. But I'll tell you, it speaks to me volumes. Have you ever done, you got a verse in your Bible that you've marked 50 years ago. And then you read it all of a sudden today, and all of a sudden now it, 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 it speaks more than just that verse. You, you read it before and said, well, that's a good thought. But then you read it and says, it's not just a good thought. There's deep, profound things here that spoke to my heart. Isaiah chapter 55. Everybody knows this verse. Everybody got Isaiah 55? Look at verse 6 there. It very simply says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now, first off, you and I know, and we've heard it taught, who seeks who? You know, if man left to himself, he'd never look to God in the least. It wasn't Adam in the garden hunting around saying, where are you at? It was God saying, Adam, where are you? Jesus gave the story of the good shepherd and what he do. Set down on a rock, and one day that little lost sheep come looking for him, saying, Shepherd, where have you been? You've been lost for a long time. It wasn't that at all. It was the sheep that was lost. If you find something, that implies that it was lost, not you. The object that you're looking for. So the good shepherd went out looking for the sheep because that sheep was lost. And it was the shepherd that done the seeking. But, now, this command right here, this verse is not given to those who are outside the covenant of God. This is given to the people who have already encountered him, who've already received the divine oracles of God. 
the commandments of God. They have cut the covenant. They have entered into agreement with God. Because while they were down there in Egypt, their knowledge of God was very extremely limited. Very small. Because all they heard was maybe a couple of stories about their fathers who had encountered him. And a, a promise of Joseph saying God's going to visit you and bring you up out of here or something. It was vague. you talking about looking through a glass darkly. Brother, they didn't have much uh, knowledge or revelation. They had no scriptures. Had not been one verse in the Bible been written as of yet. A revelation of God was was not to be had very much. So this God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of a sudden now he pays attention to a man out there taking care of sheep and tells him to go down there to Egypt, and we all know the story. These people who didn't have much knowledge of God, now they see a display of his power that was unlike anything they'd ever heard of before. Who had ever heard of these kind of things? Even from the heathen pagan gods. Had any of them, oh, they may have conjured up a few fairy tales or something that happened to one of their big heroes or something. But as far as a god that could display power and them witness that power in such a way that it brought a great powerful country to its knees and forced them to do what a man who was a shepherd with a stick in his hand was telling them to do. This brought them, this got their attention. And then when they come out and saw the miracle at the Red Sea, that enemy that had plagued them and beat them and killed them for all those years is now dead and gone forever. It's no longer a threat to you. No longer it's not going to pursue you. It can't pursue you. It's dead. And now they come to the mount. And I don't know if you realize this. I think you do. But God gives Moses a specific command and tells him to have the people wash their clothes today and tomorrow because the third day I'm coming down, I'm going to talk. In other words, I'm not going to send anybody. I'm going to pay them a visit and I'm going to address them. Now, that mountain, I don't know, I don't think Hollywood could produce anything what I imagined in my mind like it was like. The fire of God came down on that thing. It was all ablaze. I mean, this was not just a little flickering you could roast a hot dog or a marshmallow on. This thing was consumed in fire. It was the most, it was enough to make a man's eyes get big and stare back and say, look at that. Then it smoked the billowing bellows of big smoke and thunders and roarings. And I mean, this was a sight to behold. It'd get your attention. And then out of the midst of it, we got in Exodus 20, we got God speaking to those people out of that, out of that scenery. And the first thing he does is he introduces himself. By the way, I am the Lord God that brought you up out of Egypt. That one that got you up, that's me, the guy talking to you right now. And he said, the first thing I want to tell you is don't you ever have any other gods before you. And on down he went, and what did the people say? They said, let Moses talk. We'll die if you talk. They couldn't bear up under that. And so we know how Moses went. And he, God told him what he required, and the people come back down. He come back down and told the people, and they said, "All that the Lord has spoken, we'll do." That's what a covenant is; is it's an agreement. So Moses then takes the blood, he sprinkles it on the people, and they have now entered into God. You are going to be my God, and we're going to be your people. They've encountered him. They've seen his power. He's handed them his commandments, his ordinances, and further knowledge was brought out by Moses to build a tabernacle. He later on said, build me a tabernacle because I want to dwell down there in the midst of you. Well, you know, after a scene like that, some of them might have been thinking, you, you could just stay up there on the mountain. That'd be a good place. I don't know. But he made the tabernacle, 
And over that was a big pillar of fire by night. Now, this was not a little bitty stream of fire. This warmed that whole nation. And it was a cloud. It gave them light by night, a, a fire by night, a, a cloud by day. And it led them. So they had encountered God. Now, this is the mystery of this verse. Now, this people who have encountered God in a greater way than anybody on the face of the earth. Nobody seen, heard his voice, and had entered into covenant, and him make his will and his commandments known. These people that have encountered him, seen his power in a miraculous way, manifestations of his glorious power, they'd seen it like nobody else. Now this same God is telling these people through a prophet, Seek me. Well, I thought we'd already found you, or you'd found us or something. What's there to seek? We've arrived. We're there. And this is all too often the mindset or attitude of God's people in the Christian community here. I've arrived. I've been saved. I've had an experience. I know God has touched me. I know he's changed me. And so we've arrived, and now where else, what's it left for me to do? Where, where am I going to now? Uh, what's, what else is there? And most people, as I, I think I've said this before, but in the Methodist church where I grew up at, they used to give invitations for people to come and be saved, and they did. They had a lot of revival meetings and stuff. People would come and be saved. I was one of them. And then they would ask people that had been saved, you may have been saved, we'd give the invitation, maybe you'd want to come and be sanctified this morning as a second work of grace. That's what they taught. And they would call that getting saved and sanctified. Well, today most folks are saved and satisfied. And not saved and saved. They're saved and satisfied. We've had an encounter with God. We've had a little religious experience. We've, uh, some folks have shook the preacher's hand and had a holy moment. And, and maybe some, I've had some people say, oh, when I went up that morning, cold chills come over me. Well, I, I, I used to have cold chills when the Lone Ranger come on TV. You know, but anyway, that's, uh, uh, don't mean to downplay anybody's experience, but Folks have an experience like that, or when I come up out of the water, it hit me and I spoke into That's great and fine, I, but then we feel like we've got it. There's no need of really getting too serious about things after that. But it's these very ones that he calls out and says, Seek the Lord. Well, I, I've already found him, or he found me one, or however you want to word it, but I mean, I've got him. What, what's there to, the, oh, no. No, you don't understand. He says, you, you've just come into relationship with him. Now, does anybody here know what the definition of eternal life is? Nobody. You know, Brother Tom. Well, never had a beginning. Okay, that is what it is. That's true. But I'm going to tell you what Jesus said eternal life was. Keep your finger right there on that because we're coming back to this verse. You all know that great, that great prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17. John 17. Jesus prayed a prayer to the Father. Could we think for one moment that his prayer was misguided? That it was full of selfish ambition and desire. Could he have for a moment prayed something that was contrary to the will of God? I don't think he could. In his humanity, I, I, I think he was in perfect alignment with the will of the Father. Have you guys got all of that? John 17. I want you to look at the definition of what eternal life is. Verse 3, he says, and this is life eternal. This is it. This is, uh, let's go up to, to verse, uh, let's just start reading at verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. 
as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. There's, uh, there's predestination sticking out like a sore thumb right there. And, and verse 3, he said, I'm going to give eternal life, and this is eternal life. Now he's going to tell us what it is. What is it there? That they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Ladies and gentlemen, that word know him, it goes beyond just shaking somebody's hand and making their acquaintance, having a brief conversation, and somebody said, you know, well, yeah, I met him. I, I, I could say I've worked around him a little. I know the guy. No, no, no. To know him means in a very intimate way. You are acquainted with him in an intimate way. And that does not come by a person attending church once a week. That's right. That's right. It doesn't. He tells us, seek the Lord. What do you mean? Now you've encountered him. You've received an experience with him. You just got started. That's right. You haven't arrived. You haven't, you know, and many people are satisfied with that. So in case I die, I got that base covered. How selfish. How self-centered. Uh, such an attitude like that is. Listen, the, the thought now is, this one that saved me, I want to get to know him. Well, you know him. In, I know him in the forgiveness of sins. I know him as Savior, as the one that rescued me, that delivered me from the kingdom of darkness and the powers of hell. I know him in that, the one that's healed my sick soul and body. I know him in that way. But you know something? There's a whole lot more about him that he wants you and me to know. And therefore, he says, seek me. It doesn't just come automatically wafting down out of heaven and blowing in. and, and on. No, no. No, God's not going to reward a person with water that's not thirsty. He's not going to reward someone with certain blessings that never seek after him. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Now, I don't know about you, and I never thought about this. But you know what that implies pretty heavily? Seek him while he may be found. What do you get out of that? It implies there may come a time when the opportunity to do so is not there. Taking for granted God is one of the biggest insults that we can pay to the Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus, which ransomed my soul from the powers of sin and brought me back and gave me the gift of eternal life. Treating Him in that manner. And folks, I can hear it all the time. I see it on Facebook. I hear it out of conversations. Oh, I love the Lord. Well... I can't people, and if you say this, people say, now don't you judge. Yeah, yeah. That is one of the biggest backslid statements right from the pit that there ever was nowadays. Right. Right. Folks have got the idea that if I point out your sin, I'm judging you. No. I've got a right. Somebody says, I love the Lord, and they if I told you, Brother Tom, I, I, or a man or wife, I love you, honey, I love you more than anything, and never speak, and never give you a, a, the time of day, you, if my wife treated me like that, I'd look at her and say, no, you don't love me. Right. Well, we're married, we come together, ain't that a sign of love? Well, it is. But the relationship just started at marriage. Now we're going to get to know each other. And that's life eternal, he says, to intimately know the living God. And you can't know him outside of Jesus Christ, who was the Word made flesh. Seek him while he may be found. Don't take him for granted. You will not seek God on your terms. You will not get up and, and go into intense prayer when you get ready. When he calls, when he says, I want you to come and intercede for such and such place right now. Uh, 
listen, the ball game's coming on here in a minute. I'll do that when the ball game's over with. Thank you. I'll go get somebody else. And you just lost out. He may knock at the most inopportune time and tell you, I've got something very special I want to show you. It's just between me and you. It's a verse of Scripture. It won't mean a thing to nobody else, but it'll set your soul on fire because I've designed it for right now to bring it out and apply it to your life in a personal way. Well, that was probably just me thinking that. And so I'll wait till I go to bed. And then I'll tell God on the way to the pillow how great he was and thank him for the day and pass out by the time I hit the pillow. You don't seek God on your terms and you don't take him for granted. Seek the Lord while he may be found implies there's going to come a time when he can't be found. He's not going to be there at your beck and call or for your convenience. We seem to treat him like we can just Think we got this idea we can treat God anyway. And being he's a loving God, we can do what we want and he'll just be ready when we're ready. That may be the case sometimes, but it's not the case all the time. Let me give you a couple of examples in Scripture. And incidentally, and I'm, we're not going to read them, I'm going to tell you about them because you know about them. Incidentally, the Scriptures tells us that these things were written before time for our learning. They were written there for us to learn something from them. Well, the first thing I want to call your attention to, the message of God came in the days of Noah. I'm going to destroy this earth. There's going to be destruction on every square inch of this planet. Everything's going to die. There's only one place where life will be found, and that is inside that ark that Noah is building. The most silly, foolish thing. But you know, while it was not raining, a man had an opportunity to go in there. The door was wide open. But the door came, the day came when the door was closed. Not another bird, not another snake, not another animal, not another dog, not another animal or species of any kind. The last one that was going to go, it's done. The rest of them out here, they're going to die. Not another living human. When that door shut, opportunity was gone. But God's a loving God. I, I think that when it goes to rain and I can go up there and, and, and get in. No, that's not going to happen. So we see that just a little bit of it there. Now let's think of when the children of Israel, when they were fixing to come up and they come out of the promised land. They came to Kadesh Barnea. Remember that story. They sent the ten spies over. Or the twelve spies. Ten of them came back and said, there ain't no way we can do that. And two of them said, we can do it. And God said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to let your carcasses drop in the wilderness. And if you'll read the account, there was a bunch of them said, we've, we've, we've kind of failed God. We've messed up. I tell you what. Let's gird ourselves up and let's go on over now. We, we messed up, Lord. We're going. We're going to go. And he said, no, don't go now. That's it. They said, well, we're going to go. And they got slacked. Uh -huh. You could tell me that there are times that you can just come, God, just whenever you get a notion to. You'll do it today if you hear his voice. Harden not your heart as they did in the provocation. You won't come to God when you want and how you want. And like, there could be no greater invitation than for him to say, Child, you've been busy. You've allowed the cares of life to really burden you down. And I understand all that. I'm not going to fault you. As a matter of fact, it's out of love and concern. I want you to just shut all that, that noise of the world, the clamor and the voices, shut them all out. And... Uh, just come on along with me for a moment. Let me bless you and soothe you in my presence. And there's a little verse in here you'll come across, and it'll mean so much to you, and it'll strengthen you, and it'll help you. At a time like that, you want to sit down. Because if you don't, you may have robbed yourself out of something that would have furthered your walk and your growth in Jesus Christ. Seek the Lord 
while he can be found. Call upon him while he's near. That all implies that there may be a time when he's not there. Now, with that in, 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 in mind, and, and keep, that, keep that thought in mind, that once we come to Jesus, we haven't arrived. We now have a, it's an opportunity. It's not a responsibility that has to be carried out and you're going to get beat up if you don't. It's a wonderful heavenly privilege. It's a heavenly invitation and an invite to know him intimately. To look upon him and be baffled and amazed as you gaze upon the glorious things of that other world. What a privilege to be given that. What a privilege. What you, you couldn't ask for any privilege than for God to allow you to gaze upon the scene of his suffering and actually paint a picture in your mind's eye and your spirit and your soul experiences just a little bit of Calvary. Or look upon the wonders of his glory and the, the, the magnificent call of his spirit that he saw you in it before time even started. Before anything, he saw you, he knew you. And not only that, uh, I, I read uh, uh, out a psalm this week, and I looked up in the Amplified, Brother Tom, and, and a couple other versions I had. And it said, you know, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and all my parts were made like... And then the others worded it like this, said, All of my life was written down in your book before I was ever thought about. Oh and you sit about that and look at that, and I don't know, you see... Other people would go, oh, yeah, yeah that, that, that's interesting, that's nice. They, they not getting the experience. When you have him share something like that, it leaves you so amazed and dumbfounded, you search to find words and can't find them. <laughs> you are privileged to look beyond the curtain of time and look into things that are eternal. Everything in this world will come to an end someday. They'll cease. All the great personalities that you can think of, some of them are dead. They're gone. Great men of knowledge that tried to stamp out this Bible, they're dead. Bible's still here. Other great men who've done wonderful things, personalities, some of my favorite heroes that I knew when I was a boy, the Lone Ranger. He, what was his name? Clayton Moore, wasn't it? He's gone. George Reeves that played Superman. He's gone. Other men that I knew in the church. Brother Branham. I didn't know him, but he's gone. Minister Brother Homburg or some of them, They're gone. All, everything in this world is passing away. It's vanishing. But you know something? When God gives you a little peek, and I think he gives you just a little because it would overwhelm your soul. I don't know if you could handle that much of it. But when he gives you just a little peek, and you sit back there and think, my goodness, that's something that's eternal. That time, that the system of this world, that the devil, that religious-minded men and church members cannot take from you. Can't take it from you. It's something to be guarded and held. I'm, you know, I've got, my dad when I was five years old got me an old ball glove. I still got it up in the attic. I guess it's still up there. I need to guess to go up there and look and see. But it, it's up there. And you know something? That old ball glove is not worth nothing. But that's dear to me. Sure. That means something to me. Well, you know something? Certain little things and nuggets that the Heavenly Father shares with me, that means something to me. And it should mean something to every child of God. God help my wretched soul if I take for granted little things that God quickens to my heart and my mind in times of intimate fellowship with Him. Amen. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Amen. May come a time when your physical features fail you and you're not able to grasp things like you did when you were younger. May come a time when your eyes grow dim. Listen, I, I used to, I got this Bible years ago because the big print in it. 
I take my, my glasses off and can read it. I take them off now. And guess what? Kind of difficult to read that big print without my glasses. Used to could read the tiny, tiny, tiny print without my glasses. Can't no more. That lets me know that what the Apostle Paul, and I don't mean to be discouraging, but it's a fact. This outward man is perishing. Yes, sir. There may come a time when you'd like to get up and sing a song, but you can't. Your vocal cords are shot. Maybe time when you want to pick one on the guitar, but you can't arthritis in your fingers and you can't play it no more. Might be a time I like come to church, but I can't. Ain't got no car and nobody will bring me. I'm too old to go get another one. You say, oh, that's... No, that comes to people in life. I've walked in nursing homes and sat and looked at people and they look up at me with that pitiful look and you could tell they're thinking, I'd give anything. There's things that'll, that'll be dear to you. What was it David said? When he was fighting the Philistines and they had surrounded and surrounded Bethlehem, what was it he said, Brother Tom? Can you tell me? He sat there when you, he said, oh, I'll tell you. I'd give anything to have a drink from that well down there in Bethlehem. I remember drinking that. All of a sudden, something as simple as a drink of water from a certain well means a whole, whole lot to you. There comes a time when some certain person singing a certain song. It meant a lot. You, you heard him, and I, I remember us boys making fun of a couple of the older ladies in our church. We'd go by, what did you hear? Lord, she scratched. I'm I'd give anything to listen to one of them nowadays. I'd travel and walk over here on foot and sit to down, wore out, just to hear one of them sing now. Simple little things like that begin to mean a lot to you. Seek the Lord while he can be found. What I'm saying, oh, God will always be there. But you know some things that have been brought into your life by way of a blessing, they're not always going to be there. They're not going to be the, the opportunity to do that, the opportunity to say that. I'd like to go over and see old brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Well, you better do it now because tomorrow might be too late. I don't know if that makes any sense to you or, or not. Now, let's go on over and, and read another verse of Scripture in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. David... The priest and all of them there, they brought the ark of God. David had erected a tent. It was called the Tabernacle of David. You know, if you've never done a study on that, I'd encourage you to do a study on it. Do you all know what the Tabernacle of David was? It was a tent. And he placed the ark of the covenant in there. <clears throat> 